Hallelujah. Glory to you, Lord. Glory to your name. Great and mighty God. The name that is above every name is the name of Jesus. And we just worship you, Lord, King of kings, Lord of lords, God Almighty in the flesh. You came, you died on the cross for our sins. You rose from the dead and you're coming back again. And Lord, we worship you, the Jesus of the Bible, not the Jesus of the New Agers, but the Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Holy One, the Righteous One, the Sinless One, the One born of a virgin, the One who died for our sins, the Lamb of God that came to take away the sins of the world, the One who rose from the dead, and the One who is returning to be King of kings and Lord of lords over all the heavens and the earth. We worship you today, Lord. We exalt you today. We thank you, Lord, for those that believe, repent, follow you. There is the hope of eternal life. And there is a heaven and there is a hell. And Lord, we thank you for the, for the truth of your word. And I just pray that you anoint the service, anoint me, help me give your word today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated this morning. I want to welcome everyone to Fire and Grace Church this morning. Um, we're going to continue from last week. Um, didn't really plan on it, but uh, actually the Lord showed me something in the scriptures that I have never seen before and never preached before. So I'm going to get a, look, uh, a new little nugget of truth to give you this morning, but... Uh, I have to kind of unwrap it and recover some ground so you know where we're coming from. But uh, um, just pray for me today. My uh, heart's a little heavy, though it shouldn't be. But uh, my great aunt, Nora Lee Jones, at 97 years old, she passed away this week. And she was like a second mother. She practically raised us, her and my other great aunt, Zola, and my great grandmother. And... So it's kind of like the end of an era. My great-grandfather, he and I were like this, and he died in, I think it was 71, and then my great-grandmother in 91, and then my Aunt Zola, my great-aunt Zola, who fed me good with the best fried chicken I've ever tasted in my life and still haven't found anything any better anywhere. And, uh, and then, of course, my Aunt Nora Lee. Uh, Zola died in 2002. And then Nora Lee, now in 2019, at 97, you know, and I know, listen, let me tell you one thing. I think we're going to be surprised who we see in heaven. There's going to be some people in heaven that we thought didn't make it. <laughs> and then there's going to be uh, some people that are not there that we thought should have been there. But I can tell you about those ladies, my great-grandmother Pauline, my great-aunt Zola, and now Nora Lee. I can tell you they're with Jesus right now because... Those ladies that prayed me through into the kingdom, I wouldn't be here if it were not for their prayers and intercession and not to mention uh, taking care of us when, uh, when we needed it. So um, anyway, it's almost, and this is what's so wild, I didn't expect this to bother me as much as it is, but this almost feels as bad as when I lost my mom in 2010. So it's just kind of a, Kind of a tough day for me, but we must press forward. Amen? Amen. Um, today I've called this the harvest and the end of the world, or the end of the age. And uh, we're going to look at a lot of scripture. This is a, even more of a teaching than I did last week. But I want to show you again, because of course today's the day. This is June 9th, the Feast of Pentecost. This is when... I know we're supposed to be raptured according to many people out there in Christian YouTube land and um, even some pastors have been saying this and I, there's, you know, there's date setters, I call it, there's date setters in the pre-trib camp and date teasers because the date teasers don't want to get pinned to being a date setter, but they still, well, it could be, uh, you know, I'm just like, uh, you know, but uh the date setters and the date teasers are, are going to be proven wrong because uh, uh, I can assure you of one thing. I may not know a lot of things, but I can tell you the rapture is not happening today. 
tomorrow, July, August 2019. Not happening. So <laughs> let's dig into this this morning. I guess I need to flip on my so I can control my PowerPoint here. Isn't it cool? I can do this with my phone. Boy, I tell you what, it's a crazy world we live in. When I started preaching, there was no internets. <laughs> ah, let's do this. All right, are we there? All right, let's get into it. We're going to go to a lot of scriptures this morning, a lot of definitions. First of all, I want to, uh, I want to say this, and, and just before I even read this scripture, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, it talks about the foundational principles or the foundational doctrines of Jesus Christ. And one of them is the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. So this is one of the things that should be taught in churches uh, frequently because it's foundational to Christianity. It's foundational to our New Testament faith. And uh, we need to establish this. Now, there's a bunch of people out there like Perry Stone and others that will teach that there's, you know, three raptures, I think, or three resurrections. And see, the rapture is a bad term. Uh, I know when people don't watch my message all the way through because uh, I had somebody talk about, well, rapture's not in the Bible. I said, if you watch my message, uh, you'd know that I don't like the term rapture because it's not in the scriptures. It should be called the first resurrection. There's only two resurrections uh, in the new covenant and in the last days. One will be of the righteous, of the born again believers in Jesus Christ. And one will be a thousand years after that. It'll be the wicked dead who will stand before the judgment seat of Christ to be judged according to their works, but their names are not found written in the Lamb's book of life, and they will be cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. But we'll get to that. That's Revelation 20. Just remember this. Revelation 20 teaches two resurrections, and that's it. Jesus taught two resurrections, and that's it. So this is the verse here. Uh, the passage, John, the Gospel of John, chapter 5, uh, verses 28 and 29. This is what Jesus said. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which they that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Here is pretty clear, Jesus makes it clear there is the resurrection of life. And you'll see in a minute that's for those who believe in the Jesus of the Bible that died on the cross, that rose from the dead, that is God in the flesh, that is coming again. Those who truly believe in Him, repent of their sins and follow Him, that are born again, they will be of the resurrection of life. And then the others will be unto the resurrection of damnation. Um, this is what Jesus taught. Now we'll see, it's also was taught in the Old Testament uh, this is the book of Daniel, chapter 12, specifically talking about the end times, the time of the great tribulation period. So the very end here. And this is Daniel, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And he says here, And at that time Michael, that is the archangel Michael, the prince, uh, shall stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be, de shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. What book is he talking about? The book of life. How do you get your name in the book of life? You must be born again through faith and repentance toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? All right. And then he says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. All right, so there's your Old Testament passage and a New Testament one. All right, let's keep going here. Now, I know there's a lot of people that teach soul sleep. And let me just, just do away with this idea immediately. The Apostle Paul talks about that while we're in the body, we are absent, we're separated from the Lord in being with Him in, in His fullness. Now, granted, He... If we're born again, he lives and dwells within us. But Paul is making a statement here. We're really not with him fully yet, right? As we're in the body, we are absent from the Lord. And uh, there are people out there teaching when Christians die, born again Christians die, 
they go into this soul sleep and they don't, they're not, even, even the spirit soul is not going to be resurrected until the second coming of Jesus. Uh, that's a lie. The only thing that sleeps is the body. If you die before the resurrection or what's called the rapture, popularly called the rapture, if you die before that as a Christian, then your body goes into the grave. Your body sleeps. It will be awakened and it will be made new at the resurrection. But your spirit and soul are immediately with the Lord. And this is what, let's read these verses. This is 2 Corinthians 5, 6. The Apostle Paul writes by the Holy Spirit, We are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. And then in verse 8, he says this, he says, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And I can say, I agree. That's going to be a wonderful day. All right? Now here, Paul reiterates this just in case the soul sleepers out there, believers, don't get it with the first verses. Philippians 1, 20 through 24 says this, And according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, if, if death was gain, if I was going into soul sleep, how could that be gain? Would that be helping anyone on the earth or would that be helping me being in the presence of God, being in heaven? No, I'd be in some kind of weird suspended state until Jesus comes. That's ridiculous nonsense. We, when we die as Christians, spirit and soul immediately are with Jesus body is in the grave at the resurrection or the first resurrection the rapture uh, we will be rejoined the spirit and soul will be rejoined with a new body that is like jesus body that's eternal immortal incorruptible but he goes on to say he says for me to live is christ and to die is gain but if i live in the flesh this is the fruit of my labor Yet what I shall choose I wot not, for I am in a strait between the two, or betwixt the two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. So Paul says, if I die, I'm departing to be with Christ. I'm not going into some soul sleep. Okay? So let's just get that straight right now. Um, as we continue here, we're going to get into the verses. Now, I'm going to give you a little chronological breakdown. Um, you know, Jesus was preaching and teaching according to our calendars now because the calendars have mixed up, but we say are in 32 AD in that time period. So Jesus lays out, he lays out the timing of what's going to take place in the last days. And it's written in Matthew 24. It's written in Mark. It's written in Luke. Um, but... And I think that they wrote down those things earlier than even some of the scholars say. Um, but we know Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians in AD, around AD 50. And this is where he introduces them to what's going to happen to those who are alive. See, they, they understood about death because Jesus taught Luke 16. Jesus talked about the rich man and Lazarus. And Lazarus dying and being in paradise with Abraham, and then the rich man being in hell and lifting up his eyes, being in torment, tormented in the flame, begging for one drop of water. So they already understood that there's a heaven and there's a hell. But what about us who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, the believers? What happens to us? So Paul begins to reveal, and he's going to, he's going to tell you that this is a mystery. This is something that's been hidden from the foundation of the world. It was never really fully understood, but, but he begins to reveal it to the church. All right? And so 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, written around 50 AD, Paul writes, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. And again, he's just talking about... Sleep is another term for being dead. And you'll see that. So he says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, 
that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, I have, it's funny, when I get into debates with the pre-trib rapture people, pre-tribulation rapture people, they'll always quote this verse and as, if, as if this verse tells us when it is in the last day. This passage doesn't tell us when, it just tells us what it is. Right? The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. Now, this is not a complete thing because as you're going to see in a minute, we find out that what happens to the body, both those who are dead in Christ, their bodies that are risen up, and then us which are alive, what happens? Well, there's a change that takes place, but uh, there it is right there. All right. So let me say this. We believe in a rapture, you could call it, but I call it again, the biblical term is the first resurrection, or as you're going to see in a minute, the harvest. The harvest of the wheat. Well, we're going to talk about that in a second. But this was in A.D. 50. All right. So Paul comes along after this and he has to write 2 Thessalonians. And he writes 2 Thessalonians in around 51 to 52 A.D., shortly thereafter. And he has to tell them to stop freaking out. All right. It's funny because, you know, as preachers, we can mention something and people start freaking out. So we have to teach on it again and clarify more stuff, right? This is what Paul does in 2 Thessalonians because they were like, some people were going around saying, oh, we missed it. We missed this, this rapture thing. We missed this resurrection. And um, let's read this right here. This is 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, verses 1 <laughs> through, we'll read 1 through 7 here. Um, but anyway, he says, now we beseech you, brethren, and, and, and listen, can I say this as we read this? Please pay attention to these words. All right. I'm going to try to go slow and emphasize certain things because we just read over stuff. All right. And it's important to pay attention. He says, now we beseech you, brethren, by what? The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The parousia is the Greek word. And guess what? That's used for the second coming of Jesus. There's not a surprise in the middle and then we have a third coming of Jesus. All right? The second coming is an event. It is a day. It's going to happen. But he says, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, comma, and by our gathering together to him. Our, meaning Christians, being gathered to Jesus at his coming. So he's letting them know, I'm talking about that thing I was talking about in the first letter, that meeting the Lord in the air, that resurrection of the dead in Christ and we which are alive. I'm talking to you about that again. He says, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. Don't freak out. Don't be freaking out. Neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as the day as that the day of Christ is at hand. He's telling them right now, it's not happening. Don't, don't be freaking out and thinking that it's right now. So if, I mentioned this last week, but I'm going to say it again because there's hard-headed people. And there's pe I'm, I, listen, honestly, Jesus said, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. And there's even Christians out there that do not have ears to hear the word of God. Please pray that you have ears to hear okay this right here means that paul did not teach that jesus could come at any moment that there could be a rapture at any moment he was in fact telling them the opposite do not think this is going to happen at any moment there are things that have to happen first so paul did not teach eminence this at any moment and then some of these guys that say and they're pre-trib rapture people and they say they believe in eminence, but then they start saying, but, but he can't do it in the, can't do it in the winter. Got to wait for the harvest season, right? We got to wait for June 9th. Well, then you just said he can't come at any moment then. Let 
And you date teasers are just playing around, trying to tease us. But he says here, now, now why is this important? A lot of people say, why even talk about this? I, I get this all the time. I've heard this. And, and please don't make this comment because it makes me want to throw up. All right? I'm just being honest. It makes me sick in my stomach. Well, I don't know if it's pre, mid, or post. Or I'm, a, I'm a pan tribulation. It's going to pan out the way. I, please don't say that. <laughs> please don't. Because, listen, God wouldn't have put all this in the Bible Amen. if he didn't want us to know Amen. what it is. And we can know. Amen. Look, we've had false teachers deceive Christians, some well-meaning Christians, <laughs> But this is why the next verse, what does he say about it? He's talking about the coming of the Lord and our gathering together to him. And he says, let no man deceive you. Amen. That's why we teach about this. That's why I'm teaching about it. Because I don't want you to be deceived. Because we're going to talk about something. Because listen, I'm going to tell you right now. Some of you better out there, you have made no preparations. And I'm talking about just in the natural, physical realm. You've made no preparations for difficult times. You better start making some. And if you believe you're getting out of here before any of it happens, are you going to make are you going to take serious preparations? No. You know when 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 Noah God told Noah he was going to flood the earth, he told Noah, "You better get ready. Here's what I want you to do to survive. You build an ark." People always say, "I love the people that try to say the ark is a picture of the rapture." I'm like, the ark never went to heaven. Noah and his family never left the earth. Nor did Lot. Didn't leave the earth. <laughs> He's still walking on ground. Just left Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Oh, Lord. But anyway. Let no man deceive you by any means for that day. Notice he says that day. Will not come. Shall not come. Except there come a falling away first, an apostasy, a departing from the truth of Scripture. Right? What we're seeing now. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. The Antichrist be fully revealed. The end time Antichrist. The man. Not the spirit. Not some revelation that it's the, the, the papacy. That the, that the, oh, was it the Seventh-day Adventists love to teach? There's a lot of, listen, there's a lot of entities out there with the spirit of Antichrist, but the Bible teaches there will be a man who's the final Antichrist who will lead a world government and ten kings and set up a mark that must be taken to control all buying and selling. That's all coming. And whoever the last pope is will be the false prophet to work with him. All right? But he's saying this will be fully revealed. It will be obvious. Well, let me just go on and tell you that even though I, I have somebody I think it could be, a lot of people have a bunch of ideas. We have all kind of different candidates out there, but nobody really knows yet for sure. Because we won't know for sure until he puts himself in the temple of God and calls himself God. And that's an event that's coming. Now, how that's going to look, I don't know. But from Paul here, the Holy Spirit through Paul, I should say, is letting us know that's when you'll know who the man of sin is. Okay? And he will have control to issue that mark to control all buying and selling on the earth. He will have control over a world government and ten kings that will work under him. You will know who he is when it all finally comes together. That has not happened yet. So if that has not happened yet, then guess what? Jesus cannot come at any moment. The rapture cannot happen at any moment according to the Bible, not according to pre-trib false doctrine. I'm just, I, I know, they get mad at me. You know, I'm a smiter because I just speak straight. I hate deception let me get going and tell you every single if something is a deception if something is error if it's false teaching you say pastor dean we should just all you should just ignore this and we should just all get along and you should agree to disagree no i'm not agreeing to disagree i disagree and you're wrong and i don't mind saying you're wrong 
And if that gets your panties in the wad, so be it. I don't care. Because the Lord said through Paul, don't be deceived. Don't let any man deceive you. My job is to not let anybody deceive you. And somebody coming along telling you, you're not going to go through anything. You're not going to go through the great tribulation when you are is a great deception. And you better get a hold of that. Just know this, it's never the post-trib rapture people that are predicting dates. As I showed you last week. Now, let's keep going. All right, so that was A.D. 51, 52. You see the coming of the Lord and what? Everybody remember, remember that term up there, our gathering together. Everybody say it with me. Our gathering together unto him. All right, remember that. All right, here we go. That day of Christ. All right, here we go. Let no man deceive you. Now let's go to the next one. So 1 Corinthians was written between 50, 55 and 56 AD. So just a few years later, the Apostle Paul had already established the church at Corinth, and he writes them this letter where he again delves into the subject of the first resurrection, the resurrection of the righteous, what is called the rapture. Now remember, he's already revealed that this event's going to happen. But then he says, I'm going to show you a mystery. What is the mystery? A mystery is something that's hidden. What he begins to reveal, the mystery he begins to reveal, I'm going to show you is when this event's going to take place in the context of the last days. In the context of the last seven years, the Great Tribulation. He's going to start giving you the hints. All right? So remember, we're, doing, we're, we're looking at it chronologically here. So here's 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 54. Let's read this. He says, Behold, he says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. Please remember this phrase. Behold, I show you a mystery. Greek word mysterion. I show you a mystery, something hidden, something not known, something secret is beginning to be revealed, something God kept secret. I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, meaning we shall not all die, but we shall be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So then this corruptible, uh, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So Paul here says to the Corinthians, just a few years later, remember he's, he's, he's revealed it in A.D. 50, 1 Thessalonians. Then he gives a little bit more information. Well, it's not going to happen until these events. And then he gives a little more information. I'm going to show you a mystery now. Not just that there's going to be a resurrection of the righteous. I've already told you about that. The mystery is, here I'm going to give you a little hint of the timing. At the last trump. The last trumpet. Here's your hint. Here's your something that's been revealed. Well, wait a minute. You've got to remember, the book of Revelation wasn't written yet because the apostle John didn't write that. Have that experience being caught up to heaven to see the end times unfold, that whole vision of the apocalypse or the apocalypsis, which really means the revealing of Jesus Christ. He said that, that didn't happen, the book of Revelation, and we have this confirmed by church history that the book of Revelation was written in 95 to 96 AD. All right? So Paul's saying, I'm showing you something that's hidden. Guess what? He didn't tell us, but more, we know now more information was going to be coming. But the last trumpet. But remember he uses the words mystery and last trump together. It's important. Mystery and last trumpet together. Remember Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. Every word's important. It's clues. All right, so let's keep going here. 
Now remember last week, I'm going to repeat this, but it's very important to understand this, because if you don't understand this, you're not going to understand the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation contains seven seals, seven trumpets, seven vials. They each are a, each set is a story, but all ending at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Okay? We know that because I shared it last week. If you go to Revelation chapter 6, the sixth seal says the sun goes dark, the moon doesn't give its light, the stars fall, right? All that stuff, every island and mountains moved. And then it says the, the kings of the earth and the rich men and the mighty men all what? Begin to mourn and because they see, they see the Lamb upon His throne. That means the heavens, that means the firmament is rolled back. And they see and they know his, the day of His wrath has come. Well, that has to be the end, folks. <laughs> so if the sixth seal is the end, how, do we, how would we have seven trumpets after that and then seven vials after that? It cannot be. You understand they overlap one another, but they all end at the same exact time. So the sixth and seventh seal, and that's what I'm going to show you right here. That's our graphic here that my sweet wife made back in 2012. And I'm going to zoom in on this part just so you see it right here. The sixth and seventh seal is the stars, sun goes dark, stars fall, wrath of the Lamb. Seventh seal, 30 minutes of silence. But right here, in the trumpets, the seventh trumpet says the mystery of God is finished. What, the what of God? Mystery. The mystery. Wait a minute. I thought Paul said that the rapture of the resurrection is the mystery. Was finished. Well, we'll get to that in a second. And of course, at the final vial of wrath, the seventh vial, he says, it is done. And we covered that last week, how at the final vial of wrath is when Mystery Babylon is judged. And it is after Mystery Babylon is judged that the, the marriage supper of the Lamb takes place. The, the wife, the bride of the Lamb, the church is ready. And in heaven, we covered that last week. Now, let's look at this. There's the word mysterion, just so you understand the word mystery. All right, and it's the same word. When you see mystery in the New Testament, the Greek word is this. Every time that I've found. Every place I looked at. So hidden thing, secret thing. Of course, there's the Thayer's as well. Hidden, secret thing. Not obvious to the understanding. All right, now let's look at this. Revelation 10.7. Isn't this interesting? Remember, Paul showed us a mystery in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, I'm going to show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. Well, now we have Revelation 10. It happens to be the seventh trumpet. At the last trumpet, we have him saying, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he declared to his servants, the prophets. Finished means completed. End. Filled up. Like a glass that's full can take no more. Okay? This is important to remember. Do you think it's a coincidence, Paul said, I show you a mystery, the Holy Spirit speaking through them, I show you a mystery at the last trump, the dead in Christ, and we which are alive will be changed from mortal to immortal, from corruptible to incorruption. And he gives you this mystery at the last trumpet, and then we see the last trumpet, him talking about the mystery of God is finished. Do you have ears to hear what the Word of God is saying? Now let's keep going. It gets more interesting. We go to the parable of the tares, of the wheat and the tares in Matthew 13. You want to turn to Matthew 13, go right ahead because we're going to go through that parable. Very important. Matthew 13. We're actually going to look at verse starting here. Matthew 13, 10 through 7 first. Listen to this closely because this is some interaction between Jesus and his disciples, right? And he says here, And the disciples came and said unto him, starting in Matthew 13, 10, Disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? 
Listen to what he says to his disciples here. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But unto them it is not given. You know, I have to say this. I'm beginning to wonder. True disciples should see, should understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. I'm beginning to wonder on some of these people if they're true disciples. Because if you're listening to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's going to lead you into truth. Not deception, not lies, not false teaching, not false doctrines. And these guys are claiming they're hearing from God. Like I said, I'm going to mock them. Probably tomorrow, starting tomorrow. <laughs> It's going to be fun. Somebody say, oh, you shouldn't mock fellow believers. Really? <laughs> but some of you shouldn't be commenting on my Facebook and YouTube. Right? <laughs> but anyway, I digress. Elijah, just remember, Elijah mocked the false prophets of his day. But he said... Jesus said unto them, Because it is given to you know, to know the mysteries of the kingdom of them, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because seeing they see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted, and I shall heal them. And he said, Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, because they hear, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. Meaning there's many mysteries that even prophets of old did not see, did not get to see and hear that you're getting to see and hear. Now he says this as he is about to go into several parables of the sower, the leaven, and the parable of the tares and the wheat. So we're going to go to the parable of the tares and the wheat. So do your eyes see? Because let me, let me just go ahead and tell you. What I'm showing you today, you should be able to see. Unless pride or stubbornness or you've let the doctrines of men, the traditions of men blind your heart, make your heart hard. But you should be able to see this. Because see, this, is, this doesn't take a calculator and Jewish traditions and fables and Kabbalah Amen. numerology to figure out. We just read what it says. Amen. Okay? And we compare Scripture with Scripture, and we don't, get, we don't have to come up with some, oh, this is for the Jews, and this is for them, and this is for this people, and this. We don't have to do all that. We just look at it, here's what it says. Okay? People start doing the, those theological monkey gymnastics. Run. Run away. Because the word is, it really is simple. We let false teachers and messed up theologians screw up our, our understanding. But I remember when I was a young man. Listen, what I'm preaching to you today, I've been preaching for 30 years. All right, now don't get me wrong. I've been learning more. Like I'm going to share something with you from Ephesians I've never seen before. But what I'm teaching right now, before I get to this part in Ephesians that I have just God opened my eyes to the other day. I've been preaching this for 30 years, okay? Because I was, a teen, I was a teenager. I was in my early 20s, and I was able to see this. Why? Because I was a disciple of Jesus. Because I was fasting and praying and living for God and, and seeking God, lead me into all truth. And I wasn't twisting it to fit, trying to twist it to fit my theology. In fact, by just reading it, God showed me, uh, got me out of some of the doctrines of men. All right? Very important. 
All right, so Matthew 13, 24 through 30, this is where Jesus first introduces the parable. And then the disciples come and ask him to explain it. So we're going to read both parts here. This is Matthew 13, 24 through 30. It says here, And another parable put he forth Jesus unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, did not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? And he said, Nay, lest while we gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares. I'm going to explain this in a second. This is the first time I, I finally understood this part too. Gather first the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them. Remember that. We'll get back to this in a second. Gather the tares, bind them in bundles. Remember, have you seen in a field when they reap wheat and how they'll tie them up in little bundles in the field and you'll see them? But he's also the tares. Like that's when they, we're going to separate them out. We're going to tie them up in little bundles. We're going to gather them in little different spots. They're going to be burned with fire. But he says, but gather the wheat into my barn. So Jesus tells this, and he tells a few more parables. And finally, a little later, the disciples come to him privately, which is what we should always do. Lord, I don't get this, man. Explain this to me. And so he goes, okay. That's the difference between a disciple and a churchgoer. A churchgoer just go, huh, I didn't get that. Let me go back to watching TV. A disciple go, hmm, let me get my Bible out. God, I didn't quite understand all that. Teach me, guide me. I want to know the truth. A disciple will keep studying until they get it. That was free. Let's read that verse 30 again. Let both grow together until harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather you together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. All right? Now let's look at Revelation 16. Now when do you think the gathering, maybe, of the wicked? Remember, the tares are the children of the wicked one. We're going to see that in a second. And the wheat are the children of the kingdom, the believers. Well, here's a little nugget for you. Because this, is, this gathering of the tares is not the final judgment. This is the gathering at the sixth vial of wrath. This is the gathering to Armageddon. This is when he will gather a bunch of them to Armageddon, and he will gather a bunch of them. You know what's it, interesting? I believe he's going to gather them into cities. Isn't that interesting that Agenda 21 of the United Nations is to gather people into cities, little bundles. What do we find out happens at the seventh vial of wrath? Those cities are destroyed. Gather the tares into bundles. Gather them together in Armageddon. And what happens at Armageddon? Jesus destroys them with fire. Let's read this. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water there was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, uh, working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to do what? To gather them to the battle of that great day of Almighty. So there's going to be a gathering of the kings and the armies of the Antichrist at Armageddon to battle Jesus when he comes. And as you see, Jesus says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he, look at verse 16, And he gathered them together into the place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Now what happens after this gathering? The seventh vial of wrath, their destruction. Because there's first the earthly destruction and then there's going to be the judgment at the thousand years. But here we go.
Now let's look at this. See? It's fire at the second coming that destroys them. 2 Thessalonians 1 through 7, I mean, uh, chapter 1, 7 through 12. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and them that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he shall come to be glorified in his saints. So you see that right there in flaming fire, he's coming. So that gathering of the tares first is this event at the end. They will be gathered. Trust me, you don't want to be in some of these cities when that day comes. Now let's go back to our parable. This is where Jesus, the disciples asked him to explain it, and he explains it. Now pay close attention because this is not hard. All right? If you pay attention, because Jesus gives the interpretation. Pastor Dean doesn't have to give it. Jesus gives the interpretation of his own parable here. All right, so let's read. Now all these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. Now remember, he just told a bunch of parables. But they wanted to know about this one. <laughs> Wait a minute, Lord. We need some, we want to know more about this. Please explain this. Give us more understanding of this. Jesus didn't hesitate. Verse 37. He answered and said to them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. Son of God, the Lord Jesus. So he sows the good seed. What is the seed? The Word of God. He sows that. And he says, that produces fruit. He said, uh, he answered, said, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. Now, what do we know from John chapter 3? Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he will not see the kingdom of God. You must be born again to enter into the kingdom, to be a child of the king. You're either a child. A lot of people, yeah. Now, listen, if you hear anybody saying this, we're all children of God. No, we're not. <laughs> Jesus looked at the Pharisees and said, you're of your father, the devil. Right? John chapter 1, verse 12 says, to us who believe, we have been given the power to become the sons and daughters of God. When you are born again, by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, his resurrection, his blood, his sinless blood shed for your sins, that you can't be good enough, you have to have his blood to wash your sins away. Okay? He says, the good seed of the children of the kingdom, but the tares of the children of the wicked one. It's simple. The born again believers in Jesus Christ, the ones who are not. The children of the devil, the children of the wicked one. Do we have both of these groups in the world right now? Yep, you see them on Facebook every day. <laughs> Especially on YouTube. All right? All right, so we got the children, the good seed of the children of the kingdom, but the tares of the children of the wicked one. Now pay attention to verse 39 here. We got that kept secret. Here we go, verse 39. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. The harvest, the, what's a harvest? The gathering, <laughs> right, of what? The wheat and the tares. The harvest is the end of the world. I, you know, my title today, I said the harvest and the end of the world. I didn't want to give it away. The harvest is is the end of the world. Now the world, when you see the world in the Bible, there's two Greek words for it. One is in, not like that, but eon, or aeon, it's really pronounced that way, eon. Um, and the other is cosmos. Cosmos has to do with the creation. Eon has to do with an age or period of time. Okay? Now, for instance, the Old Testament. The Old Testament 
was a period of time. It was an age that came to an end. You know, the, in fact, the, the, the verse Romans 10, 4, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness, meaning it came to a finish, a completion. That's why we don't sacrifice animals anymore. That's why we don't have a Levitical priesthood anymore. That's why, you know, Jesus is our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. That's a, things change. So that age came to a completion. This is what the Torah heads get all screwed up. When Jesus said, I came not to destroy the law, he didn't come to destroy it. He came to fulfill it. It's the same word, to complete it. Amen. All right. He completed it and started a new error or a new age called the New Testament, the New Covenant. We don't live in the old. We live in the new. Amen. Now. When this one comes to an end, we'll be at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And then we begin the thousand year millennial reign, which is another age. Okay. Now, I know there's some about some people out there that have extreme dispensationalism. This was for the Jews and this. I don't want to hear all that. Because no, there's not. There, there's the only dispensations we got. Let me just give it to you. You had the Garden of Eden, that was an age, it came to an end. You had the Old Covenant, came to an end. New Covenant will come to an end. All right? Thousand year millennial reign, that will come to an end. And then we start a whole new period that we don't have much information about. Okay? But I'm okay with that. Because God's got it. He's going to filter out all this evil stuff. The enemy that sowed the tares into, among the wheat, the devil, the harvest is the end of the world. Now let's look at the word end. Does it mean end? Or does it mean seven years before the end? I'm guessing it means end, right? But let's keep reading. Hold on, we'll get to it in a second. All right, going down, he says... Uh, and I, and I kind of went on into it a little further, but it says, here we go. Verse, we'll pick up verse 39 was where we read a minute ago. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. The reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom the things that offend and those which do iniquity. Uh-oh. See, a lot of you think that the... The rapture is going to be just all good people. But that's another sermon. The judgment seat of Christ will take place of Christians. The wicked are not judged for a thousand years later. Not all the Christians are going to make it. They're going to be gathered out of his kingdom. And the only way to be gathered out of his kingdom is you had to be in it. But we'll talk about that later. But anyway, he says... As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels. They shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. Well, we just dealt with the tares, so who's he talking about? Some of the wheat. It's going to be, there's some bad wheat that's going to be dealt with. Then, what does the word then mean? My students, everybody ought to know in this church, after that, after the tares are gathered and burned, after some bad wheat separated out of the wheat, then, after this, shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. And then Jesus says, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Hear what he taught. It's not confusing. It's really not. You need a seminary graduate to confuse you. It's not confusing. The harvest is the end of the world. Now let's, let's, let's get that down in us, right? What is it? The harvest is the end of the world. The end. All right, let's read this right here. The word here for end of the world. End is... Suntilio, or suntilia, right? What does it mean? Completion, consummation, 
end. Isn't that amazing that end means end? <laughs> Consummation, right? Oh, look at this. The Strong's even says entire completion. Not just a completion, the entire completion. <laughs> Not seven years before the completion, but the entire completion, right, is when the harvest is. And then he uses the consummation. Look at what consummation is defined as. What? The point which something is complete or finalized. How can something be completed, ended, finalized if there's seven more years to go? Especially time. I'm going to show you this. Remember he said the end of the age, the end of that time. End. Completion. The final point is when the harvest takes place. That is the gathering of the wheat, the children of the kingdom, into Jesus' barn. That is what Jesus said. Shade, stone. That's what Jesus said. Pastor Sandy Armstrong. I wonder if they're standing in their church jump, jumping. Rapture practice. <laughs> Completion. <laughs> Rapture practice. Just a few hours left. <laughs> Better get it practice in. So, Santilia is taken from this root word, Santilio, and guess what it means? To end completely, bring to an end. Finish, complete, to finish. Say this, the completion, the end, the fulfillment, the end of time, the end of the age, the finish means there's no more time left. There's not seven more years. There's not going to be a harvest of the wheat of the children of the kingdom, the children of Jesus Christ, seven years before the end when he says the harvest is the end. Right? To make an end of. It just, it keeps on. Now here's, here's an interesting, it comes from, here's the Strong's, Suntilia, or uh-oh, or whatever. To come, to, listen, I don't know. To complete entirely. Everybody see that? To complete. Look, there's a reason I'm pounding this in. Okay? Because we're going to get to a verse here in Ephesians that... I mean, the Lord just told me the other day. I'm just sitting in, at home. And the Lord said, read Ephesians. Well, okay. I've read Ephesians. I don't know telling how many times I've read Ephesians in the last 32 years. I didn't get out of chapter 1. And like, here's your post trib rapture right here. All right. Look at that. To complete entirely, to execute and finish, fulfill. Oh, there it is. In the Thayers, in case you don't accept the Strongs, to end completely, bring to an end, finish complete. It's from the word Tilio. Or Tilia, or to whatever, to bring to a close, to finish. This word you see all over the place. Remember what Jesus said on the cross, it is finished? What was he saying? The price for sin, the payment for sin is done. It's finished. There's no more you can add to it. He paid it. It is finished. And he was saying too, the law, it is finished. The old covenant, it is finished. Because that's when the, tail, uh, the veil in the temple was rent by God himself. And he says here, this word here means to end, complete, execute, conclude, discharge, accomplish, make an end, expire, fill up, finish. Everybody get the idea, right? Now, there it is again in the Thayer's to bring to a close, finish to end. All right, so here we go. We go back here. I want you to look at this right here. The harvest is the end. 
the, at the completion of the age, the end of this time frame that we've been given. That is the second coming of Jesus. It is the same day we will be raptured and the wrath of God falls. That is the end. Okay? So, I'm just, I'm getting it down to you. What, what is it? The harvest is when? The completion. The finish line. The end of time. The end of this age. The entire complete end of this age. <laughs> And isn't it interesting that it goes along with what Jesus taught in Matthew 24? When he said, Matthew 24, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, for they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. This is what Jesus taught. Not before the tribulation, not in the middle of the tribulation, not some pre-wrath concocted nonsense, but the end, after the tribulation, at the complete end, the entirely complete finish line, the end of time, when time is no more, when we have no more time in this age. You see that? That's when the angels, with the sound of a trumpet, gather. What is the harvest? The harvest is the gathering of the wheat. Who, who goes and gathers the wheat? Jesus said in the parable of the wheat and the tares. The angels go gather the wheat. Again, it's not confusing if you just let the Bible interpret the Bible. You let the Bible tell you what it means, what it's talking about. You don't get to make up time periods when the Bible tells us when the time period is. All right? Here we go. Very important. All right. Believe me, we're almost at the end here. And I didn't start at 11. So uh, we're good. Now here's what, here's the new little nugget the Lord gave me. And I don't know why I never saw this in the many, many, many times that I've read the book of Ephesians. But I had to start looking up words. And when I started looking up words, I was like, oh my. So let's read this in King James, and I'm going to give you some definitions. But this is Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 through 10. He says, In whom, talking about Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his, riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the what? Mystery. Mystery. There's that word again. The mystery of his will. Now, now he mentions mystery, the mystery of his will, and then he tells you what it is because he says, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, notice the colon there. Meaning we're continuing this thought. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in him. Somebody ought to be doing a little Pentecostal jig about now. That's a big word. Everybody thinks dispensation means something. It doesn't mean. Let me tell you what it means here in this verse. Let's break it down. Dispensation here is this word, um, oikonomia. Why don't you love that one? Sounds like a disease. <laughs> but it just simply means the administration of a household. Okay? So God's just talking about the administration of his household. Remember in Hebrews chapter 3, we're told that we used to be, the world used to be under Moses' house, the old covenant. He said, but now we're in Jesus' house, right? New covenant. And Jesus has been administering and taking care of his household under this new covenant. In a certain way, we have this age, this time. 
So what he's saying here, he's just talking about the dispensation just means this time period where Jesus has been taking care of his household. The church. And he says here, when it says, in the fullness, in the dispensation of the fullness of time. You know what that word fullness means? Completeness. When time is completed. Oh, somebody, you with me? When time is completed, the fullness of time can be the end of time. The end of this age. What does he say? Notice it keeps on. The complete, the end, the finish. Finish a period. Complete, end, expire. These are the, the Greek words. Pleroma, pleruo. To complete, to make complete, to render perfect, to carry through to the end. Everybody see that? Now, we go back here to our verse. Hopefully I didn't go too far. So let's read it again. I'm just going to read the, the two verses, 9 and 10. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure, his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation, in the administering of his household, in the completion or the end of time, he will gather together in one all things in Christ, those in heaven, and those on the earth. Those dead in Christ, remember? Their spirit and souls in heaven. He's going to resurrect that body. It's going to be rejoined. Those of us alive and remain, we're all going to be gathered together in one. When is that going to happen? At the end. The completion of the time. The fullness of time. When time comes to an end. Here's what's interesting. The moment the Lord showed me this, it hit me. I said, wait a minute. There's a verse in Revelation that says time will be no more. Where is it? And then I, I went and I looked it up because I couldn't remember what, where it was. Guess where it is? Guess where time will be no more? At the last trumpet, at the seventh trumpet. Let's read it. We go back to Revelation 10, 5 through 7. I just, we just read Revelation 10, 7 a minute ago. But well, look at 5 through 7. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things that there, which are therein. Look at this. That what? Time should be no longer. Time this time comes to an end. And what's the next verse? But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God is finished. It can't be finished. It can't be completed if there's seven more years to go. Or three and a half more years to go. It can't be completed if there's a day to go. That's why I put the clock up there. Zero, zero. Zero, zero. Time's up. Time is no more. It's when that moment happens is when we are gathered to him. The harvest is the end of the world. The seventh trumpet is the last trumpet and time ends. The mystery of God is finished. There's nothing more to be done with this age. We are gathered together in Christ, both those in heaven and those on the earth. That's when the rapture, the resurrection takes place. Not seven years before the end of time. Not three and a half years before the end of time. Not a day before the end. Now, do we, we know the exact day of the end? No, we won't. You know why? Because we're not going to know when... The, the, the seven years, we're not going to know the exact day it begins. Some people think they are, but we're not going to know. So again, no man will know the day or the hour. Mystery of God is finished. Now let's look at this real quick. 
The word finished there, the mystery of God is finished, is that, guess what? That tilio. To bring to a close. To make an end. To conclude. To end. Complete. So there you have it. Now then this makes sense because this is what Jesus said. Jesus spoke in John 6. He said, And this is the will of Him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on Him may have everlasting life, and I will raise Him up. And if you look that up in the Greek, it means from the dead. I will raise Him up at the last day. The end of time. The end of the age. The harvest is at the end. All of this agrees together. I love, I can't wait to hear him try to debunk this. It's going to be a sad display of confusion. Because it all makes sense. And then you get to this. This will be, this is our last verses here. This is our last passage. This is Revelation 20. Remember I told you in the beginning we'd get back here? Revelation 20. This is after Jesus comes, and this is what Paul, I mean, uh, John saw here. Look at this, verse 20, I mean, chapter 20, verse 1, let's read it. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. Listen to verse 4. Close attention here. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, for they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So if you're going to live and reign with Christ a thousand years and you died because you resisted the Antichrist and the mark of the beast, that means you were resurrected before the thousand years started, right? Right before. But then he says this. Let's go on. He said, but the rest of the dead, the wicked dead, Live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, what I have asked this question to pre-tribulation rapture believers for years is how are people who are going to die or resisting the mark of the beast and the Antichrist, how are they going to be in the first resurrection if you say it happens before the Antichrist comes and before the mark of the beast comes? I usually get crickets chirping. I asked one pastor friend of mine who wanted to argue this with me years ago. And I asked him this question, and I think I asked him that question around 2011. And I still yet to get his answer. <laughs> the first resurrection, the, which is what they call the rapture, happens just before. It happens at the end of this age, the last day. And then we begin what? The thousand years. We end an age and we begin another age. And the rapture happens on the last day. And that is the first resurrection. He says, blessed and holy is he that gets to be part of that, that gets to be changed into that new body like Jesus has. Whether you're dead in Christ or whether you're alive and you're changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye, what a blessing to be part of that. Because, see, the next resurrection happens a thousand years later. Let's finish reading Revelation 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was no place found them. Now, this is after the thousand years and after the devil is released. 
And he says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now let me say this very clearly here. Death never means annihilation or ceasing to exist. If you die now, the first death, if you die now, yes, your body dies, but your spirit and soul will go on living forever somewhere. Same thing the second death. It is not annihilation. All death means is separation from life. And the first death is separation from physical life. The second death will be separation from spiritual life. And who is spiritual life? Jesus. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Death, the second death does not mean you will cease to exist or be annihilated. It means you will be separated from him forever. And there are degrees of punishment and torment depending on how you lived your life. That's why there's going to be a judgment. Hell's not going to be the same for everybody. I've told somebody, it's not one size fits all. But let me tell you this. Even if hell was an island paradise and I was put there by myself, it would be misery to me because there is nothing that satisfies the human spirit, soul, and body other than the Creator Himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You want to be with Him, His presence. In His presence, Psalm 60, in His presence is fullness of joy. Amen. He is peace. He is hope. He is life. You don't want to be separated from him because you've been stubborn and rebellious and you've, you want to love the sin and the satanic pleasures of this life more than you want to love and obey him and be with him. And I told uh, Nancy and we were talking about it yesterday. You know, we, we've got some people, we have some Christians right now struggling over the doctrine and the concept of eternal damnation, eternal punishment, eternal hell. But as I said a few weeks ago when I talked about this, Look, God knows the heart of every person, and not only does he know the heart of every single person, he knows their thoughts, and he knows what they will do in the future. And he's not going to let people who in the future would ruin it for everybody else. He's already let that happen, and he's going to put a stop to it. You can't have it, but what? why does God allow evil? Well, he's going to put a stop to it because he's got to stop evil people. He's let the wheat and the tares grow together until when? Till the end. But there's a day coming and he knows who he's going to allow in his kingdom and his house forever. And I tell people all the time, I said, look, I love my daughters. I have three daughters. Right? And I have a stepdaughter and a stepson. I love them. I will feed them if they need food. I give them clothes if they need clothes. I care about them. I love them. But if they wanted to come live in my house and be rebellious and dangerous and do drugs and be violent and put me or anybody else in, in, in harm's way, guess what? As much as I love them, as much as I want to help them, they will not stay in my house. I don't care if they're living on the street. That's their choice. You know, we've got, we, you know, I've got, I've, got a, I've got an older daughter that's still having a little bit of rebellion issues. Now, I'd help her in a, in a moment if she needed help. But if she wanted to come in my house and do drugs, now she's not doing drugs as far as I know. Well, I'm just using this as an example. But if she wanted to come in my house and do drugs... If she wanted to come into my house and think she's going to bring guys in and be in sexual sin in my house, or she's going to influence her younger sister, or, or bring somebody in or that might do harm to her, it's not going to happen. Bye-bye now. 
And that's what y'all need to understand. God is not going to allow wicked rebels in his house. Even though he loves them. People say, well, wait a minute. Nothing will separate us from the love of God. Right? Nothing will separate us from the love of God. We're all children of God. We're all going to heaven. God will love you as you march your way to hell. As you paddle your own canoe there in your rebellion and your stubbornness and, and living and indulging the flesh and sin and wickedness. He'll love you all the way. And the sad thing about it is He's going to love you forever whether you're in heaven or in hell. See, I love my children right now. I love them all. My wife will tell you. But it doesn't mean we're all in good relationship at the moment. But what happened? The boy that left his daddy's house? Luke 15. What, what, when he left his house, he took his, he took his father's inheritance and said he went and lived in riotous living. Right? What did his father say about him when he left? My son is dead and lost. He was talking about spiritually dead. Was the boy on his way to heaven while he's in the pig pen and spending his money with the harlots? No, but when he came to himself, Amen. when he said, you know what? This life isn't what I thought it was. This sin, this pleasure is a sin. It wasn't quite what I thought it was. I'm going to humble myself and go to say to my father, I have sinned against heaven and I have sinned against you. Please let me just be a servant in your house. Humble, repentance, turning from sin, leaving the harlots, leaving the riotous living, leaving. That's called repentance. When you get up and you leave the pig pen and you go back to the father humble and say, please forgive me. I have sinned. I don't want that anymore. I want you, father. That's repentance. Those are the ones that get in the house. Those are the ones that get in the kingdom. Those are the ones who will get eternal life. Not the ones who say, I'm going to live out here in sin and rebellion and wickedness and think, oh yeah, when I die, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to, my, I'm, my father's going to bring me back in his house. No. No, 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 no. That's on you. You better decide that before you die. You better decide that before you die or before he comes. And what I'm beginning to find out is there's a lot of people dying right now. You don't know when your day is. My aunt got 97 years. My cousin that lived next door to me died a month ago at 44. And she went into that surgery actually thinking that she was going to make it through. One of our students, Kelsey, who lives up in Pennsylvania, just had two of her cousins hit by a drunk driver. Both of them died. We just had the voice of the Auburn Tigers and his wife killed. By a 16-year-old that fell asleep driving. Amen. You think you know when your day is? You don't know. You better not be living in the pig pen when your number's up. When your time is up. Listen, your time may end before the end of time. For a lot of people, that's the way it's going to happen. A lot of people out there say, oh, okay, Pastor Dean, I agree with you. And when I see this, I'll repent and get right with God. When I see the mark of the beast, when I see the Antichrist, when I, you may not see tomorrow. You better stop making excuses. You know why? Here's the deal. It comes down as simply as this. You choose to love God and hate sin 
Are you going to love sin and hate God? And back in 1987, I chose to leave the pig pen. And it switched. And I hated drunkenness and sexual immorality and drugs and started loving God. I've said this many times in many sermons. The question is not, does God love you? The question is, do you love God? And if you love God, you will want to follow Him. You will want to walk with Him. You will want to be in His presence. You will want to do what pleases Him. And when you start to experience His presence and His joy and His peace and His strength... You don't want to go back to that. There ain't nothing in that world. Let me tell you, I was in that world. Amen. The drugs, the high wears off. Yeah, you go do more drugs. But it still wears off. There's still those moments. Everybody know what I'm talking about? I remember the first time I started cocaine. Woo! Yeah! I felt good for about 20 minutes. <laughs> really good, right? Conquer the world good, right? But when I woke up the next morning, there was a new darkness and depression and heaviness on me. There was a new sorrow that I had to live with. I remember the first time I smoked marijuana. Woo, high, feeling good, mellow. I woke up, though, the next morning, and there was a new heaviness and depression. I've shared this many times. I remember the first sexual sin I was involved in as a teenager. Everybody, oh, yeah, you know, the world is all about sex, right? It's all about that. But most guys will never admit this, right? Because we've got to be macho men, right? Yeah, I did that thing, right? I did the deed. <laughs> I woke up the next morning so depressed I nearly wanted to kill myself. See, sin brings death, and it brings darkness, and it brings demons. And then you have to do something else to try to get over that feeling. And that's why people get addicted to sexual sin. That's why they get addicted to pornography. That's why they get addicted to drugs and alcohol. That's why they get addicted to pills, even, if the, even the legal ones, right? Amen. They're trying to overcome that feeling where the conscience and the Holy Spirit saying, stop, stop destroying yourself. Stop doing the things that God hates. Stop. Repentance is when you finally say, okay, God, I'm gonna stop. Doesn't mean you won't ever trip up or fall again, but you don't wanna live in it anymore. True repentance is, I'm done with that. I'm done with it. So, let's stand this morning. Ah, oh, I feel like we need to do another song here. Um... Oh, let's do uh, that uh, freedom ring. If you out there, I'm going to say this as we, we're going to do one more song of worship before we leave this morning. If you've not repented and made Jesus the absolute Lord of your life, then don't waste any more time because it's your decision. And you can make a decision to repent Start walking a new way. And he'll meet you. And he'll start revealing himself to you. And he'll start taking care of you. And he'll start helping you. But you have to make the decision. And even if you've been saved, if you've been a Christian for years, but you've gone back to alcohol, drugs, sexual sin, it's time to leave the pig pen and come on home. It's getting dark. Remember my dad used to say back in the day, We'd be out playing in the neighborhood. You'd just be home before dark. 
I tell you, you better get in before it gets too dark. Thank you. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you. There is freedom, deliverance, forgiveness of sin, salvation, God, restoration, peace, joy. There's everything that we need in you, Lord. And I pray that anyone out there that's been listening or maybe even those who... Uh, have listened after the fact, Lord, that you will bring them to that place of repentance, faith, restoration. Lord, an encounter. Lord, with you, Lord Jesus, and your precious blood that was shed on the cross and the power of your resurrection. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for saving us. We thank you, Lord, that it's not just a creed or a religion or a belief, but that it is a real living relationship with you. I pray that everyone that hears this message will find that relationship if they don't have it. And we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, just a few things before uh, we leave, just to let everybody know. Of course, if you have tithe, offering, anything you want to give, baskets over there. Uh, those of you out there, I want to say thanks to, listen, so many of our extended church family out there. We couldn't even, we couldn't even have this, this building right here if it wasn't for them. So uh, I just want to say thank you for all your giving and support. It's just blown my mind how people have supported this ministry. Um, also, we're looking forward to um, Skyfall, October 4th and 5th. Again, if you... Uh, if you haven't made your reservations and registered and you want to come, please do. That's, uh, just go to skyfall2019.org and the registration button is on the first page. Um, it's only $20 registration fee, but you get a t-shirt out of that. And we're just doing that because we had so many fake registrations last year. We, we had to do something to stop it. So, you know, trolls don't want to give you 20 bucks. So we... we uh, <laughs> um, so it, it has fixed the problem this year. They don't want to give real names. Really. Right. They don't want to give real names or emails, right, or anything like that. Um, but anyway, skyfall2019.org. Um, register if you plan to come October 4th and 5th. And 3rd. And 3rd. Really, we'll have stuff most all week long. Uh, the 3rd. And then, of course, we'll have Sunday church service on the 6th. Um, so last year was an awesome time. I mean, even the Wednesday night prayer meeting we had here with people who were in town early, this place was full. We had a great prayer meeting uh, before um, Thursday, and uh, it was just awesome. We're going to have a golf, the golf outing again, the picnic again, and, uh, but it's going to be awesome. And we're going to do the first time ever, the Lord has spoken to me to do a mass deliverance service. So we're going to do that. I don't know if it's going to be the first night or the second. But uh, it's going to be a powerful time. And I just want to ask everybody, too, especially our church here, those of you out there, even if you can't come, please be praying and fasting and praying for us, doing spiritual warfare, binding demons in Jesus' name, and praying that God will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. Uh, there's going to be a documentary crew there. There's going to be some unsaved people there. Um, it's it, we're going to stream it live and so there's going to be we're, we're we're talking about we're going to thousands and thousands of people are going to be touched by this all over the world i mean even sunday morning i'm getting i'm getting messages from groups of people watching and in, in south africa australia um so I'm, I'm just blown away by what god's doing so uh even if you can't make it to skyfall please pray that god will pour out his spirit and and people will be touched by the power of God. Lives will be saved. People will come to Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Um, anyway, that's all I have. You guys here, hug some necks before you leave.